Indeed. We might make a start this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So good afternoon to you all and a very warm welcome to our lively panel discussion on consumers and future food preferences. Who decides what we eat? <clears throat> My name is Mike Williams. I'm a Sydney boy, your friendly facilitator and moderator for this session, which goes through till 5.30. We're going to try and to be very as, as interactive as we possibly can this afternoon, and I'll go through some ideas to, my, uh, to generate that interaction. Firstly, the topic, future food. So we need to place the consumer fairly and firmly in this outlook, this outlook 2013. So we're talking about who decides what we eat. That gets to the very heart of the complexity of choice and consumer behaviour. So it's a conversation we need to have. It's a conversation we need to have with, with a focus on us as consumers. So we're going to try and shift from some of the th early thoughts this morning of, of Outlook away from the intensity of productivity, that focus on productivity we've had from the morning, and move along the value chain toward the demand side, to us as consumers. But as we discuss this idea of us as consumers and our future food preferences, one of the questions I'll be asking the, the panel, and you might like to think about it as well, is what capacity we have to move towards any future food preference ideal or position or setting that we might think would be, would be useful. So we need to think about, from a capacity point of view, this focus on, on productivity, if in fact we can produce that which we prefer to eat. Paul Morris this morning in his opening remarks commented and talked about the key pillars for the future, for the need for a transformational change to meet consumer demand and the probable increased importance of supply to segments of the market with, and I quote, new comparative advantages. He suggested some areas of future preference in his talk this morning. He talked about the quality. He talked about low carbon. He talked about high animal welfare, consumer goods and foods. And we might want to start thinking about this and a much longer list that I'm sure you have in your mind. We also need to consider what the role of research and development might be in both understanding the future of our food preferences and in making sure that we have the capacity and the knowledge to drive those preferences. So we have a very diverse and informed and inspiring panel for you this afternoon to get stuck into these issues. And firstly, could I say my thanks to Anna Carr uh, from ABEARS, who's been a person who's been putting together this afternoon's session. So to say thank you to Anna. Uh, but let me now introduce you to the panel. If they could uh, wave or make some comment to identify themselves Trish Stone is the Acting Assistant Secretary for the National Food Plan Task Force and uh, she's obviously working in the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, DAF, the acronym. And I would ask that uh, if people are asking questions that we might use uh, as, as be as acronym free as possible to make sure we're communicating effectively with all those in the audience. Robert Hadler uh, is joining us on the panel, the General Manager of Corporate Affairs at Coles. Lisa McGlynn, the Senior Executive Responsible for, the, for Health Group at the Australia, Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. Gary Dawson, the CEO of Australian Food and Grocery Council. And last but not least, Matt Perry, co-founder and partner at the Republic of Everyone, an advertising agency with a special focus on sustainability. Before I ask the panel to open their thoughts on the, on the topic at hand, just some ideas and thoughts in the way that you might interact. So just in terms of format, I'm going to ask the panellists for a one minute, just a short and sharp, to get the width and the breadth of the conversation going around this theme about what we might be eating in 2030 and why. Uh, and then I'm going to ask the panellists, having moved across that width and that breadth of ideas where you'll start to see some divergence and differences perhaps, to ask them to expand on the why question. Why are we eating what we are in 2030. So we'd 
futuring, when they're going to come back as to the information that supports those futures. But I'd like to ask you questions. I'd like you to come forward as, with your questions. We have Twitter feeds as well. Uh, so if you'd like to use the uh, hashtag ABEARS with the, the plural, A-B-A-R-E-S, then uh, two people here, Anna and a colleague, are taking those Twitter feeds and be able to feed them down to me uh, as, uh, as they've been moderated. So if you would use the microphones, it is a little tricky for us up here to see you. It's uh, very bright up here and quite dark in the auditorium. So if you would like to provide your name, if you are from an organisation that's sponsoring you today, to let us know. And if you could then direct your question to a person, that would, um, to a person on the panel, that would maximise then the opportunity for other questions to be asked as well. So what are we eating in 2030 and why? A one minute opener from the panel. Lisa, I wonder if you might like to lead off. Lisa. Thank you. What are we eating and why? Well, in 2030, I'm happy to say that uh, we have a much more informed and health literate society uh, where we've, we're managing to take a bit more control of our own health and our own um, informed decisions about what we eat. We're looking at eating five serves of vegetables and two serves of fruit and a good mix and range of, of other uh, foods. But in 2030, I, I, was I took pause to reflect on a publication that I worked on in 2012 about Australia's food and nutrition. And I was pretty surprised to find, looking back 17 years um, into the past, that at that time, 91% of 16 year and over adults weren't eating enough fruit and vegetables, um, and only 50% were eating enough fruit, and, and uh, 91% weren't eating enough vegetables. 20% of us were drinking alcohol at risky levels. We had one of the highest obesity rates in the world. 25% of children and 60% of adults were overweight or obese. And it wasn't the same for everyone. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, rural and remote people, and those in lower socioeconomic groups had decreased fruit and vegetable intake, lower rates of exercise, were twice as likely to smoke daily, had increased levels of asthma, cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, arthritis, and mental health conditions. So I'm happy to say in 2030, the world is a better place. Thanks, Lisa. If I come to you, Gary, the 2030 question, and what are we eating and why? Just an opener. Thanks, Mike. Um, in 2030, I think, uh, what's our food going to look like? I think it's going to look like whatever we want it to look like. Uh, literally, I think the, the biggest of the mega trends that's transforming society is the, is the trend towards individual empowerment, and that's going to mean a, an explosion in, uh, in consumer choice uh, over that period out to 2030 in the area of food, as it, as it will in a lot of other areas. And if you put together those trends around uh, mass personalisation, driven by the, the uh, um, ever-increasing computing power, communications capability of digital technology, big data driving uh, much quicker uh, responsiveness throughout the retail and supply chain uh, for food, um, poverty reduction and the lifting of literally billions of people globally out of um, subsistence into what's loosely called the middle class, although we might not call it that, but, but in food terms, lifting them out of food being purely for survival to food being really for enjoyment, as it is for most of us, um, and, and advances in uh, molecular uh, diagnostics, genetic mapping, uh, understanding of food, and enabling much greater tailoring of food to individual or group preference, um, uh, pre-packaging, much greater convenience foods, uh, potentially delivered uh, straight to the door, Rob, possibly by Coles, <laughs> um, automatically restocking your pantry when it's run down because you'll have the same just-in-time uh, ordering systems that the, that the stores have and, and uh, catering to your individual uh, tastes and needs. So I, I think in 2030 we're, we're going to see a real explosion in, in consumer preference driving a uh, much greater uh, range of um, a choice coming out of the food supply chain. So as we come to a, a retailer's point of view, to you, Rob, your thoughts? Uh, thanks very much. Um, I'm very excited about the future, uh, very optimistic about what 
the future is going to hold for consumers, but also for farmers, food manufacturers and retailers. Technology is going to fundamentally change how we shop, when we shop and what we buy. Um, we're already starting to see some of that now with uh, um, uh, virtual walls in, um, uh, in, in uh, train stations and tram stops uh, rather than having to go into the, the old bricks and mortar uh, shops that uh, we all grew up with. Um, we're seeing a, an explosion of new and innov innovative types of products um, that are quite often coming from not only the big multinational food manufacturers with great global drive and R&D, but also increasingly from very small Australian food producers, backyard food producers that are using uh, the internet to create a much more sustainable base. So we're seeing great explosion of variety uh, of new product innovation. Um, having said that, I think the consumer will ultimately decide what they're eating in 2030. And three things will never change about what the consumer wants. The three key drivers for the consumer are quality, service and value. They're three immutable laws of retail. And if retailers don't deliver on that, they won't survive. No matter how in the future, we deliver it or when we deliver it. But I'm very optimistic that retailers will increasingly search out collaboration to drive in innovation and speed to market. Because ultimately that's what the consumer of the future will want. When they open up the, the door of the fridge, the fridge will tell them what they're out of stock in and it will send an email to the store to deliver it. We have to be in a position to meet that demand. I'm very excited about that, what that future looks like. Thanks, Rob. Can we move along to you, Trish? <clears throat> okay. Um, so I suppose for me, um, I look at the subheading here, which is who decides what we eat. So I think that in 2030, the National Food Plan will have been a remarkable success. We will be still one of the most food secure countries in the world will be, still be a uh, significant exporter of food, um, but we'll also import food to meet our demands. Um, but, you know, who really decides what we eat? Well, you and I do. Um, today, we spend, today, Australians will spend $355 million on food. And um, retailers want a piece of that action and they want to provide what you want. So what you decide you want to eat, what you decide today, how you're going to buy your food and what you're going to buy is going to shape the food system of the future. Um, and so I suppose our food system will look different in 2030. Um, yes, there's the whole internet and the connectivity that will drive this, but I think the real reason it's going to look different is that Australia's going to look different. In 2030, our population will have increased by about 50%. You think about the fact that We'll be living um, either in, um, mainly in cities, which is what we already do. Only 4% of us live in remote or very remote areas already. Um, there's gonna be new forms of families that have been changing. And you think about, I think it's predicted a quarter of us will be living in single person households. It's gonna change the way that we eat and we buy food. Um, and uh, by 2050, 60% of Australians will be over 65. And there'll be, I think there'll be a trend of, uh, if I, anything but my partners to go anything by, it's uh, that forever young trend. I'm going to eat in a way that's going to help me live and survive. I'm going to take vitamins. I'm going to take all of these things to, to keep my health as best as I can. So I think those things will drive the trends in the food system as we go forward. But I think there's three things that are never going to change. And I suppose mine are different to Rob's. Mine aren't quality, service and value, which is obviously important, but for me, I think the things that people are motivated by, it's a triangle for most of us. It's price, it's convenience, and it's some of the other things that people think are important, things like um, ethics, organics, eco-foods, um, religious, fair trade, those type of drivers. 
people will ma make their decisions based on three, those three things. Um, some are more in the price corner of the triangle, some are more in the convenience corner, and some shop more with their other principles corner. Um, but we all, it's a bit of a trade-off in all of those things. You can have, you can go for, for convenient and cheap, but you know, you have to trade off some of potentially your other, other desires. So I think that the food system that we'll have in 2030 will be the food system that you shop today. Thanks, Trish. And we come to you, Matt. The, uh, we've already got some ideas about the democracy of choice emerging here, so we might even pursue that idea. But to you, Matt, your, uh, your first ideas on what we're eating and why in 2030? <coughs> yeah, um, I, I was going to sort of kick off as coming from the advertising industry with a, with a fact around the fact that we spend over hundreds of millions, over 500 million um, dollars a year on food related advertising and a large proportion of that is spent um, currently on, on sort of high fat, high sugar, um, sort of low nutritional value food. Um, but yet we've heard just in the last five minutes the fascinating developments that are kind of coming through the food, um, food uh, retail systems and, and marketing systems. And um, much of that stuff today feels like it's a little bit niche, um, pop-up pop-up stores, pop-up real food stores, farmers markets, um, unique ways in which people are kind of producing food in their own backyards and selling it online. These feel quite niche and quite um, potentially a, a little bit irrelevant, but, but actually when you look at the statistics, so if you I took a look at Roy Morgan, which is a, a, a good tool for what's going on in the world um, um, at, the mo at this moment. Unfortunately, I couldn't get this year's data, but I got data from 2011. And it said that 50% of Australians were avoiding GM food. 50% um, of Australians were avoiding additives and 50 additives in their food. And 50% of Australians were um, eating less meat. So you can sort of see that people's need for authenticity and, and kind of transparency in the food that they're eating is already well and truly into the mainstream. This isn't a niche game anymore. This is, a, this is very much a mainstream game. And I suppose what I would like to see, or, or what I think we'll, we will be seeing in, in the future is a lot of that money, probably more than $500 million, I would think, um, being spent on some of the more innovative and creative um, and, and uh, um, uh, sort of, if you like, uh, more nutritional um, products as opposed to the, the products that aren't um, necessarily um, doing us the best uh, amount of good at the moment. Thanks, Matt, indeed. Okay, so we've got some opening ideas, some opening thoughts there from the panel in terms of what they might be eating in 2030 and just starting to get a flavour for the why question. Is there anyone in the audience who might have a, a view about what we're eating in 2030 and start that discussion as to why prior to us uh, to, to getting into a bit more depth with the panel here? Anyone have a question? If they do, they'd like to uh, move down to one of the, the microphones and state who they are. Uh, otherwise, I'll move on. Just, uh, Sir, you might like to provide your name and an organisation if you do come from an, a good organisation. Uh, Philip Napier from KPMG. Uh, my question is, can the panel tell us uh, how much of that food is going to be produced in Australia versus how much is going to be imported? So the ratio of imports to domestic? Yep. Indeed. Thank you, sir. Uh, who would like to direct that question to? Who's got the most knowledge on the panel, in your view, to answer that question? <clears throat> I think probably retailer in the first instance, uh, advertiser in the second instance. Let's leave it to retailers and advertisers if we can. Thank you. Uh, retailers, look, what do you think, Coles? I think the majority of food is clearly made in Australia now and will continue to be made in Australia. And Indeed, the latest research I've seen, uh, which is underpinning future consumer trends, right. is a preference toward locally produced food, uh, fundamentally because it's fresh uh, and people believe it's higher quality, uh, and uh, they also support Australian made. Uh, that's not to say that uh, there won't be a role for imported food, there, there clearly will, uh, but the vast majority is Australian made now and I think it'll continue to be in the future. If I could ask you, Matt, uh, what's advertising directing mm. the uh, consumer to? What is it trying to? What sort of preference is it trying to exercise in the consumer's mind? Yeah, I, I'm, I don't have the statistics to back this up, but my my um, my intuition would be that what peop what the consumer is looking for is is transparency and authenticity around where its food's coming from, and also there is a clearer 
deeper knowledge and understanding now about what is high nutritional value food or good quality food. And, uh, and a lot of that, particularly around fresh food, is obviously locally produced, as close to source as possible. I think you can sort of see that if you include things like farmers markets as part of the marketing mix for food, you can sort of see the popularity, even though relatively small compared to, say, Woolies or a Coles mainstream supermarkets, um, you can see the popularity of those sort of defines that and sort of starts to push that agenda. And you can, and you can see that Coles and Woolies are replicating that. The butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker now exist in Coles and Woolies. So you can, I, I think that localization is going to be critical in the future. There's no doubt that uh, Coles in particular is responding to the consumer demand for fresh product. Uh, we're trying to create the feel of a market in a supermarket. Uh, and uh, there's an explosion of new products, fresh products, coming through. Uh, and MasterChef and My Kitchen Rules is fundamentally... Uh, sparked an explosion of family interest in fresh food and cooking at home. Um, a lot of it on those programs uh, is aspirational. Uh, but what we see is that people actually use those ideas in simple and affordable ways to cook with the family at home. So I think you'll see more of that. And as you, you've mentioned that, what's, what's happening to the sugar content, fat content, other contents of food as those shows take off? Is it having an impact on, on in fact, the, the style of food we're eating, Rob? No, I think uh, both retailers and food manufacturers, and Gary can talk about this in particular, uh, are, are really rapidly responding to uh, consumer preferences for more natural food, to take the nasties out of food. Uh, and they're doing it in a voluntary way because that's what consumers want. Um, Governments, and, and we're listening uh, to government, and we're also working with NGOs that uh, are clearly focused on the obes obesity agenda. Uh, and I think you're seeing a much quicker and fulsome uh, response to those issues, uh, and it'll grow over time. Gary, can I bring you in here? Just Yeah, I, I think um, the underlying challenge here is the extent to which we value add uh, within Australia. I mean, we eat uh, bread, not wheat. We eat uh, steak, not... Um, steers. So uh, how much of that value add are we going to capture in country I think is a challenge uh, given the competitiveness issues. It, it, we are a high cost economy. Um, all those cost inputs are, are rising um, and that's a challenge um, uh, to which uh, innovation is clearly one of the keys. Um, the good thing is there continues to be very strong investment into uh, food and beverage uh, manufacturing in Australia, despite the pressure the, uh, the sector's under. Uh, there are some very uh, you know, innovative things happening within large companies and small companies, just to work out Rob's point. But I guess the, the, um, uh, if we look out to 2030 and we think about, well, well, what could see us fail to achieve the potential, then I think uh, we need to be wary of anything that, that impedes or unnecessarily provides a drag on that innovation. I think we have to be incredibly vigilant on that. We need to be encouraging innovation in this country, um, including in the food space. I, and so I, I do think um, uh, there's, a, there's a, a very strong future for food and beverage manufacturing here, but it's not without its threats or its risks. Thanks, And Gary. if I could add one quick thing on... Uh, it just occurred to me that... You know, in 2030, we won't be sitting uh, on the couch watching My Kitchen Rules. Well, millions of us will be competing in it in the, at the same time, streamed on the wonders of the NBN, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, you know, with sensors in our kitchen to, to uh, evaluate the taste and, uh, and, uh, and uh, 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 nutritional value of what we cook so we get instantaneous uh, competitive Thank results Absolutely. across the country. Now, wouldn't that be great? Good, Gary. We're going to go to you, sir, on, on number three, and we'll come to you on number one. Gary, uh, number three, can you just mention uh, your name and organisation? Yes, Peter Draper, uh, Nuffield Farming Scholar. Um, we've got responsible service of alcohol now. I was just wondering, 2030, we're going to have responsible service of food, so um, going through a McDonald's drafting gate and your BMI's, sorry, you've got to have the salad. <laughs> Well, you, you've pretty much got... I mean, at the moment, you've got consumer information there now, really. You've got the Treatwise program on, on treats, uh, similar to Drinkwise. You've got uh, menu board labelling in fast food restaurants so you can see the kilojoule content. Um, you know, our view on this is you, you, you give consumers the information to make an informed choice. Um, 
we shouldn't be demonising any of these foods. Um, uh, the objective is, of course, a balanced diet and, and uh, you know, energy in, energy out. Um, but uh, absolutely, put, put the information in front of consumers and, uh, and they can make up their own minds. One of the interesting trends is towards much greater convenience size packaging. And that enables portion size control and, and, uh, and nutrition control. And the supermarkets are seeing this, ready to eat meals, um, big growth area. And, uh, and, and again, it, it comes back to catering to a much broader range of consumer preference. Lisa, responsible service of food for the future, thoughts? I think it raises a, a very, very interesting and, and challenging uh, issue for us in Australia. I mean, it's good to talk about the increased sale of fresh fruit and vegetables and decreased um, use of additives and all of those things, but the facts are at the moment that extras or treat foods, so things like biscuits and cakes and sweets, sugary drinks, form about 36% of the energy intake of adults and 41% of the energy intake of our kids. So um, that combined with the amount of food we're throwing out, $5 billion worth of food per year in this country. So I think it, the challenge for us really is to have that connected view. Um, so to make sure that our health services, our community, the education we all have taking personal responsibility, working with the, um, the producers and the retailers and marketers. I think, you know, we can all win in this if we work together on it, but we've really got a way to go if we're going to, um, you know, our cancer rates are falling, our survival from heart attacks are, are, are rising, but we're putting things in our mouths at a rate where our exercise isn't keeping up. Thanks, Lisa. I won't ask you, Trish, if responsible service of food is in the future <laughs> food plan. I won't put you on the spot there, especially in election year. So, number one, if you would, uh, your name and organisation. Yes, nice and uh, Michael Harris. I'm from ABES, so I'm taking sort of insider's prerogative here, I think, to uh, as the organising uh, organisation of this event. Um, but pick out on, on a few things that have been said. Um, I want to bring up two key points that I don't think have been touched on yet. One is... Um, and, and I think between now and 2030, whatever we say about 2030, these things will be important things to consider. Um, the first is that we aren't just food consumers. In fact, there's lots and lots of different subsets of food consumers. Um, and uh, there are young families bringing up young kids in the suburbs. There are group houses full of students and young professionals who will be eating uh, McDonald's and Pizza Hut at least several times a week. There will be um, other families who will be aspiring to compete on my kitchen rules and, and buying fresh food and, and uh, niche high value products and going to farmers markets and so on. There's a whole range of food consumers now. Um, and the other thing linked to that is, is lags in the system whereby uh, we spend a lot of our early part of our life by, by and large having our food choices made for us. And those then build in certain you know, uh, presumptions about the kind of food that we're used to, and it can be high, if we're fed a lot of processed food, it can be high sugar and high fat, and we develop a taste for that kind of stuff, and it can be hard to work out of, out of uh, our tastes as we get older. So there's, those two things uh, actually complicate the whole picture, and you can end up um, with uh, stuff that's slow to change, even as we see rapid change through television and stuff. I mean, the, the, the explosion of food channels and food shows and cooking and stuff looks to dominate. And, and we can see, as has been said, Coles is moving to look like markets within a store and so on. But there's still a lot of, uh, you know, drag on that as people still buying old style processed stuff or fast food. Um, that hasn't changed. And, and uh, you know, as we move to fresh food, uh, more and more f and fresher food, that leads and, and it's one of the it's actually one of the drags on the system because one of the pe reason people buy a lot of processed food is because they can store it, and fresh food gets wasted. Um, we're a rich country, and by and large, we waste fresh food um, at the retail and consumer end, whereas in <clears throat> developing countries, they tend to waste it between the farm gate and the consumer. You know, it just they don't have the transport or the refrigeration or the storage. We do. We still waste fresh food because we buy it and then we cook some of it and some of it goes off and we throw it out. Okay, so you might come to the point if you would, sir. Sure. Um, basically, so we have a bunch of different types of consumers. We have a lot of stuff that where we've uh, built up our tastes early on and we've had food choices made for us. 
Um, I think we've got to be careful about how we can jump towards 2030, assuming that trends that we're seeing on television or something now are just going to dominate. Um, but let me throw that back to um, anyone who wants to handle it. So we're talking about enduring megatrends here. Maybe I could start with you, Matt. What do you see as the things that haven't been mentioned, rather than saying things that have been mentioned, are there some enduring megatrends you think that are such that they will have impact on 2030? <clears throat> things that haven't been mentioned so far. <laughs> That's pretty tricky. Um, I, I, I mean, I think, um, I think it's a good point that you can't take what's happening right now and, and extrapolate that out over 20 years or 15 years or whatever and expect that that's going to be the answer. But I think what you can do, and you can do this in food in the same way you can do it in, in any kind of industry, is you can see mega trends as they become or certainly interesting trends as, as you sort of see them as they emerge um, are signals for what's going to happen in the future. And I, I find, I would think it would be sort of difficult to see that the knowledge that we are starting to kind of get now through multiple sources, whether that be MasterChef, which probably won't be around in uh, 2030. Um, maybe. But maybe, maybe. Well, <laughs> yeah, if you guys have got anything to do with that, I suppose not. Um, but, um, or, uh, you know, or channels like Twitter, which also might not be around in the future, but there will be other, other channels where people are going to get their information from. That level of information that people have, that knowledge that people have, is, is, now, is not going to go away. That's now beginning to be embedded in the way in, we, in which we think about food. That's not to say that everybody eats properly or that they understand what the food is that, you know, that they're eating is doing to them. Um, because we've got this converse kind of conflicting um, other trend, which is the shift towards foods that you know, aren't high in nutrition. So it's kind of, you know, it's kind of an interesting one. It's, it's, it's clearly impossible to say what's going to happen in 2030. But I think what you can say is that the information and the knowledge and the way in which people are going to understand what it is that they're putting in their bodies is only going to become greater. And I think that will lead to a change in the way we eat. I, th I think it's interesting to go back uh, to 1960 when Coles opened its first supermarket at Baldwin in Melbourne. Um, uh, Basically, all it contained was shelf-stable groceries, cans uh, and uh, uh, boxes uh, full of food, processed food. Um, if you were my age and you went into a supermarket then and walked into a supermarket now, you'd hardly recognise the place. Um, and a key driver of that uh, is the changing composition of the population uh, and their changing demands for different types of food. Uh, I think uh, the ageing of the population, uh, changes in ethnicity, um, uh, the immigration boom after World War II uh, saw an influx of uh, um, you know, Mediterranean food products onto our shelves. Uh, we're now, we've, we've been through the Asian boom, we're now going through an Indian boom and a North African boom. Uh, and we're going to go through a Middle Eastern boom. And there are pockets of Australian society where these are very concentrated. Uh, so, um, Melbourne's got a high uh, level of uh, Greek population and North African population. Sydney's got a high Lebanese population uh, and Muslim population. Uh, we're having to tailor food demand and supply to particular ethnic groups in different locations. Uh, I see this continuing, this fragmentation. That's going to pose extreme challenges. Uh, to food manufacturers and retailers and farmers in how we meet that uh, multiplicity of food demand and the fragmentation of food in society. It's going to be quite a challenge. Gary, can I ask you to just hold, if you would? I'm going to take this question, this gentleman here, and, I'll, and another question over here. Then I'd like the panel to start considering this, this seminal question, who decides? Who's out there manipulating? Is there a conspiracy out there about food choices? What are the what are the forces at play, subtle forces at play that are in fact providing us with these preferences or providing us with information on which we make those preferences? Just like the panel to start considering the who question. Who's involved in making these preferences? Is it all just democratic and we make our own individual choices or our choices for our family? Who's involved in those choices? We'll come to you, sir, at number three. Then we'll come to you at number one. Thank you. Your name and organisation? Uh, Mark Narrow, Australian from the CBH Group. 
Can you say uh, that again? Just Mark Narrastrand from CBH Group. Thank you. Uh, my question is um, probably a bit broader than the way we've been focusing on the word consumers at the moment. Um, earlier today, we had a few uh, comments about how the bulk of our um, agricultural produce is exported and uh, is um, in addition that uh, there was a number of comments about creating value by um, finding those niche um, markets. Um, and so my question is more about well, what will the consumers of uh, Southeast Asia, Northern Asia and so on be eating um, and, um, and how we will provide that. Oh, we, we need to focus on that to be able to provide that uh, market. And so if there's any, any viewpoint on that. Okay, we're taking us international. So the preferences of Gary, Food and Grocery Council. What are uh, Southeast Asians eating that is of, us, of Australian made? What's the changing yeah, that occurred? A, There's some of the a, trends that might be there. It's a good question and it plays back to some of the discussion earlier about um, one, of the, one of the big trends globally is that um, you know, between now and 2030, you know, estimates range to between one and two billion people moving up the income scale uh, in, into a, a, a capacity to have more discretionary spend. And food, you know, we know is going to be a key part of that discretionary spend. Um, now, you know, there, there's clearly an opportunity there. Um, and, and uh, you know, the smart companies, a lot of companies in Australia are already positioning for that. They're investing... Uh, to, with an eye on that, uh, that future. It does require some faith in the longer term uh, sustainability and competitiveness of the, of the manufacturing um, sector in Australia, but there's plenty of companies investing in that. Um, uh, Rob and I recently uh, were in Melbourne where Kraft uh, unveiled a, a major investment in an innovation centre at uh, Ringwood focused on uh, chocolate and confectionery products for the Asian market. Um, you know, this is a discretionary spend, um, but their projection is that this is a, a major opportunity. Um, and so I do think, um, you know, it, it, it brings into play many things. It brings into play our, our, um, our standing as a very well-regulated uh, food producer, Australia, I mean, as a, as a well-regulated place for food production, for, for both primary production and, and uh, food manufacturing. Uh, that clean green image, um, and it, it brings into play um, our innovative capability. So again, if we're looking, you know, it's pretty easy to see the comparative disadvantages when you're in the food and beverage, grocery manufacturing sector. You know, the, the, the cost, um, uh, principally the, the non-competitive cost structures here uh, that, that individual companies can't do much about, but. Um, but here we have companies finding the comparative advantages and positioning for that for the future. So I think that is an, is an area of, of great potential. I mean, I've, I've only been in this job seven months, but I've, I've made a point of getting out at least one or two days a week and, and talking to CEOs and visiting factories and, and the diversity of food exports from this country, I think, would surprise a lot of people. We think about meat and, and uh, wheat and, and so forth, but... Um, you know, you've got you've got a company uh, operating in Bathurst with a with a an increasing um, export market in Japan for sausage skins, for example. You know, ba you know based on collagen and and again trading off the clean green image. The uh, food additives uh, exporting out of Australia is is in pretty healthy shape, right through to companies like Kraft and um, and uh, and you know they're, they're, this is the Cadbury part of Kraft, I should have said, uh, uh, and their expertise around products, uh, chocolate products. Thank you. To you, Matt, and we'll come then to you. So you've been very patient. Thank you very much indeed. We'll just, to you, Matt. You said you wanted to have a, yeah, just a just word about this uh, this international perspective. Just uh, one, one point, really, which is that I think what Australia will be selling to um, international markets is its brand. Um, it's not so much about the products, it's about the, the, what Australian food represents. And so I was in China last year and, and all I heard from them about food was that they love New Zealand food because New Zealand food's <laughs> clean and green and healthy and it doesn't have all sorts of dioxins in it or something. Uh, if you remember the milk, milk incident um, a few years ago, that, that was their big concern over there at the time. And New Zealand's done a fantastic job of positioning itself to the Chinese market for key products. And, and I think that's 
you know, regardless of wh whether we're selling beef or wine or cheese or whatever it is, we have to sell the brand first. Thanks, Matt. You've been very patient. Thank you. Your, your name and organisation, sir? Um, Khan Joe from the Commonwealth Bank. Lovely, um, thank you. Probably a more retail-oriented question. I was wondering that um, if we can assume consumers continue to be time poor and given this push towards health consciousness, Whereabouts in the value generation chain would you see that as giving more opportunities? I mean, would it be a case of fast food restaurants continuing to offer more health-based choices, or would it be a case of more salads and frozen meals being health-oriented that you can find at supermarkets, or whereabouts would you see that as generating more value-adding um, activity? Question to you, Rob. There's no doubt that uh, health and well-being is a big consumer trend at the moment. That I think with the ageing of the population over the next 20 to 30 years will only uh, deepen and broaden uh, in its uh, impact on uh, food production and retail in Australia. Um, I think technology is going to make a big difference. Um, 10, 20 years ago, we couldn't provide in Australia. Uh, I used to work at Goodman Fielder, which was at that stage one of Australia's biggest food companies. Um, still is. Still is. Um, but it, could, it tried um, uh, ready meals uh, in the 1990s. Uh, there wasn't sufficient technology uh, in Australian retail at that stage to support, and they couldn't hit the right price point for the quality. Uh, to make that a success. Um, time has now moved on and 20 years later uh, we're seeing an explosion of um, uh, ready meals uh, and that's going to take off. Uh, you're seeing in uh, fast food chains and moving to more healthy alternatives. You'll see that in retail as well. Um, and the internet will provide uh, consumers with more information. In, in fact, there'll be information overload. Uh, so consumers will have to be very selective in the information they seek and how they get it uh, so they have effective choice uh, in what they uh, uh, end up purchasing. Yeah, I had someone in my office this morning, in fact, a very entrepreneurial woman who you know, raised a, a venture capital to start a, a business producing um, pre-prepared frozen meals that are specifically... Um, uh, geared towards diabetics and pre-diabetics. So this to me is a very interesting development. This, this, is, a, this is a group that, um, uh, you know, depending on the, on the figures you see, but a sizable market. Um, the, 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 the products, you know, a range of five different uh, uh, options now, in, uh, now starting to be stocked in supermarkets. And, um, and it's an example, I think, of, of opportunities that are opening up around this uh, convenience pre-prepared meal area. Portion sizes are controlled. Nutrition obviously is, is, um, uh, is, is carefully uh, balanced for the, for in this case for diabetics. But she made an interesting comment which was that in their consumer research um, the, the, one of the very very strong messages was that that consumers would not compromise on taste. So in other words, it's not enough to produce this with the health message. You cannot compromise on taste. People will, will still only buy food that they like to eat. Fundamentally true. So, um, you know, that, that, that's, that's a key insight, I think, in, in terms of yeah, a reflection of consumer preference is going to drive uh, business behaviour. We'll take these two questions from Lisa and then <coughs> gentlemen at number four, and then we'll come back to you, panel, if we may, about the who question. Who's involved in making these preferences for ourselves or are we a fully democratic society we all make our individual choices? To you, Lisa, your first question. Uh, Lisa Adams from Lisa Adams & Associates. It picks up on your question, Mark, of who, did, who decides. Um, and also it relates to health and wellbeing. My partner is a GP, very well educated, very good at assimilating information. He has the best lipid profile you could imagine. He'll see two margarine products one will have a health claim that it will, you know, prevent heart disease. He'll pay twice as much for that product. Um, is my partner deciding or is he being manipulated by these claims? Um, a, a friend of mine had developed breast cancer and then I was walking down a shopping aisle and I saw the anti-cancer boys and um, blueberries. 
with a premium price put on the blueberries. Um, to what extent is, the, is this kind of manipulating people's fears to pay a premium because of claims being put on food? Thanks, Lisa. Uh, Who look, I, that? look, I'm happy to, uh, to kick this one off. I, I'll be honest and say it's both push and pull. Right? So the push part of it is that uh, food manufacturers who are innovating on food all the time and retailers are pushing new ideas out to customers. No doubt about that. Uh, but ultimately, it's whether customers want that product and they have the ultimate decision-making power. So unless we're meeting those three key uh, imperatives, as, as I said before, quality, service and value, they've got choice. They don't have to buy it. So... Um, there's no conspiracy theory, it, you know. We've got 600 stores, our competitors have got 600 stores, there's the internet, people have got unparalleled choice. Um, so we've got to compete out there hard for, uh, to get people in. And there are, you know, there's quite strong laws around what you can say in your marketing and, and you know, the false mm. and misleading test and, and and there's been a lot of work. There's a lot of work underway now around health, the health claims you can make on your packaging. So, yeah, I, I, if it, if it's not true, you know, there are serious penalties for that. You, Lisa. I think we have choice, but I'm not sure it's informed choice. I think, you know, comparing and analysing information. You know, how many, how much walking do you have to do to burn off how many kilojoules? How much does it take to burn off a hamburger versus an apple versus tub of yogurt you know I think um, we've got a very more educated more literate community but I'm not so sure we're literate and in those areas um, we know too that kids who watch less television um, have much lower rates of obesity and overweight but a lot of the food advertising for those treat foods I talked about before are still happening during prime time children's viewing so I think we've got advertising, I think we've got informed choice and I'm sure that we need a, a bit more literacy about what, a, what it actually says on the packaging, what kilojoules are and what we need to burn off. Thanks Lisa. We'll come to you sir, number, number four you. up there, if you, your name and uh, serial number. Uh, thank you, uh, Gordon Davis from Beef Producer. Just I'd like to go wind back up the uh, value chain a little bit and um, we've got this, uh, this vision of a very diverse, educated um, uh, consumptive market. What do people at the producer level need to do to participate in this uh, in this future? And in particular, um, you know, there's been a little bit of criticism of the supply chain practices of uh, supermarkets. So how do we how do we as uh, producers um, position ourselves to be to take part in this uh, this vision of 2030? Great. So how do we connect the value chain? Much more. Good. Thank you, sir. I think it's a good question and I'll declare my conflict. Gordon and I used to work together, so that was a, probably a Dorothy Dix question. Dorothy was in the room? Um, look, uh, I, I, having worked in primary production, food manufacturing and retail, um, the one thing that stands out in my mind over 20 years is the length and complexity of the supply chain and the fact that farmers uh, have been very divorced via price signals from the consumer uh, and quality preferences. Uh, that's made it very hard for, for many producers at, at the individual producer level uh, to respond quickly uh, to what's happening in the market. And that creates tensions. Um, we've seen, uh, as well as having seasonal conditions and cyclical conditions which exacerbate uh, the commodity price booms and busts. Um, that complexity in the supply chain, the length of the supply chain, makes it very hard to get those price signals down to individual producers. Um, I think what we're seeing, though, with uh, the growth of the internet is an increasingly educated uh, and sophisticated primary producer. Uh, and. Uh, what we're seeing in, in many of the, uh, the small producers that we're dealing with directly uh, all over every state in Australia uh, is that they're very uh, innovative. Uh, they are tapping into uh, markets globally to see what consumer trends are doing. 
They're watching what's happening in Asia, in the UK and in the US. They're pinching great ideas. So Bannister Downs, uh, which is a small dairy producer in the southwest of WA, was the first dairy producer in Australia to produce milk and cream in pet containers. Right? So vacuum packed, flexible plastic containers. Not bottles, not the big two litre plastic milk containers that we're all used to, but they're, and they're growing rapidly. From a two person family dairy operation, they now supply half the retail network in WA. That's a really good example of the opportunity that can be seized by individual family farmers in Australia uh, by looking uh, and having the guts to try something different. Thank you. Let's just move on to the who question. I'm going to ask with, uh, start with you, Trish. <clears throat> Is there a role for policy development? You come from the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. You certainly don't want to be uh, the minister on the panel making decisions about policy, but are there is there a role for policy in deciding what we eat? Is there a role f in the preference for government? For Is there any market failure that requires government intervention in who decides what we eat? Look, obviously... You might um, move the microphone nice and close if you would. Obviously, the government is involved in the food system. And we talk about, you know, Australia has one of the safest food systems in the world um, because there are rules around what people can sell about how food is produced, about use-by dates and refrigeration and how it's transported. And certainly there's rule that, you know, there's a role for the government in that part of the food system, making sure our food is safe, making sure that the food that we produce is sustainable, that we're not, you know, um, trading away our future for, for short-term gains today. But when it turns when it comes down to deciding what you eat. No, I don't think there is a role for government to decide what an individual eats. I think there's a role for government to make sure that people are informed and the choices that you make are informed choices. But um, I don't think there's a role for government to say, you mustn't eat chocolate or stop drinking coffee or, you know, taking away wine from me. Um, I don't think that's, I don't think there, there is a role in, the, in that part for government. Is there certainly a role around safety, sustainability, um, and there's definitely a role around, um, uh, you know, making sure that there's information, the information is truthful, but I don't think it, making the choice for farmers about what to grow or telling people what to eat, I think that's probably a bridge Good. too far. Thanks, Trish. Can I come to you, Matt? You're, you're involved in shaping preference. You're involved in changing behaviour. You're involved in shaping a brand's position and how it relates to the community. So what's your perception on who decides what we eat? What are the roles that are played there? Um, I think it's easy to target marketers and, um, and manufacturers who then go and sell their wares or the supermarkets that sell, sell the wares um, in terms of you know, not necessarily kind of delivering the full truth. And some, I think perhaps in the past some of that stuff might have been justified, that view. But the, the reality is, and any marketer today understands that you know, 20 years ago you could pretty much get away with saying what you want. And if somebody could, had the money and the time and the effort and the inclination to go after you, they might win a court case. Today, if you make a mistake, that mistake will be projected not just around Australia or around your local community, but around the world. And we've seen that time and time again. Um, you know, all, all sorts of, of issues now are flagged and, and raised and are, uh, and there is a movement, an online movement behind this that is driven by the NGOs um, who are doing their job and doing a really good job of highlighting some of the risks and issues that we're facing. Um, sometimes some of us might not like that, but, but you know, that they are a potent force that we have to now respect and take seriously. And, um, and, and the marketers themselves know that actually the consumer, because they're in control of information, because they're in control of, of knowledge, they um, will respect you more if you 
treat them respectfully. And so, actually, marketers are now very transparent about what they're doing and why they're doing it and how they're doing it, because they know that if they do that, they'll get greater loyalty and they'll get a better result. So I, I think that the control actually is in the hand of the consumer. Good, okay, so it's a sense of counterintuitive there. Lisa, you've had a bit of a crack at uh, the choice is not necessarily complete in your view. Any way you'd like to expand on this idea about uh, who decides? <coughs> well, I mean, I think, I think you're right, Matt, that, that there are, there's a lot more transparency than there has been. Um, but again, I don't think we can do it alone as, as just advertisers or retailers. Um, I do think we've got to look at consequences of, of how we choose and, um, and make sure that we're, we do, we do um, help people to become more literate. Okay. You've put up your uh, iPhone 5 there, uh, Rob, to make a point. Two-thirds of Australians have got smartphones now. By 2030, everyone will have more than one of these or they'll have it in their wristwatch or they'll have it in their wallet. In fact, that will be our wallet. You won't have to take cash anywhere. That's how you'll pay for food in the future. Uh, we're trialling it now. So why, why is that important to know that in relation to who decides what we eat? Well, this, this is an explosion in consumer democracy. The consumer has everything at their fingertips. It'll make it harder for retailers, for food manufacturers to sell because there will be information overload. The consumer will be, have more information than ever before. This is fundamentally changing how and when people shop. It's a, it's a revolution before our eyes. Yeah, absolutely true. And fundamentally, it's about connectivity. So it's, it's not really about um, what marketers can get away with or, or, or not. It's, it's really about um, uh, much greater connection. You know, it comes back to the answer earlier about the, the, the signals getting back to the primary producer. Um, you know, you, it enables much greater connectivity both um, between consumers and, and, uh, and different parts of the supply chain, but also for those signals to flow much more, more quickly and, the, and therefore for a much broader range of consumer preference to be catered for. And, it, and really, it's only possible to cater for that range of consumer preference uh, because this technology exists. So, so, the, so the two are, are um, intertwined, definitely. I mean, there's a, there's a new app that um, we're launching with GS1, who are the barcode people, in a couple of weeks' time, which, which is a bit of a revolution, really, because it, uh, you'll, you'll be able to scan the uh, barcode and it'll give you much richer information about that product that you, than you could ever dream of putting on the label. Allergens, um, yeah, and, and Rob's got one that, that Carl's are developing. I mean, it, it, a lot of work, everyone's developing these. Um, so country of origin information, allergens, uh, through to recipes, whatever. And, and look, not everyone's going to use it, but the fact is the technology now enables that, that much greater um, granularity, I guess, uh, uh, and response to a much narrower part of the population. So it, yeah, consumer preference, I think, and, and um, individual empowerment are, are really the, the, the drivers here. Right, so I, I've got a little app here called uh, Food Tracker. Uh, you can scan the product and it will tell you how much fat, sugar, salt uh, and every other ingredient is in the product. You don't have to read the, uh, the ingredients panel. Uh, right, that's where f consumer empowerment is going. And so what implications will that have for the trends of the, the foods that we eat, Rob? What's, what's the rationale by, behind the development of that, apart from just enriching our information to make oh, choice? I think it's a combination of uh, techno technological change which empowers people, uh, but it's also uh, responding to what consumers already want. Okay. So they do want more information, technology's providing it. Okay, we're talking about uh, who decides here. We'll go to you, sir, at number two, then come down to you, at number three. Thank you, sir, for being so patient. Uh, thanks, Lachlan McIntosh. Uh, uh, Rob, uh, 
this all putting back in his seat a bit, but uh, um, it seems that uh, what you're saying, I, look, I don't disagree with you about the power of the mobile phone to do all those sorts of things, but, but when you look around the, the country, and I'm, uh, I've, I've been out uh, in uh, rural New South Wales just recently, people are actually turning to farmers markets and, uh, and farmers themselves are going into cooperatives to make small uh, local products where there are no butchers to, and selling on the net and so that the, 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 the big app, if you like, is certainly sold to the millions of people in the cities, but there is this other um, who decides, if you like. People are deciding to go to farmers markets. It's happening here in Canberra where people do turn up on Saturday to buy from someone they know. And uh, so there is, a, there is a, I think, a trend away. And I just wonder how is that, will that trend actually expand uh, and leave the supermarkets behind? Yeah, it's a good question, uh, Lachlan. Uh, uh, look, consumers are promiscuous. 50% uh, of the shoppers at Coles shop somewhere else at some other stage uh, of the week. Uh, it's an incredibly competitive market, and it's getting more competitive. Uh, farmers' markets are lifting their game. Um, it's forcing supermarkets to lift their game. Uh, I think, you go, as I said before, I think you're going to see more of this fragmentation. Uh, it's not a given that supermarkets will stay the dominant retail uh, um, format of, of shopping in 20 or 30 years, uh, unless they offer those three things that consumers want. Thanks, Rob. To you, Trish. I was just going to say it's useful to just think about some of the stats that go with it. So, in the last in seven years, the number of farmers markets have doubled in this country, and so has the sales. And so now they're providing seven percent of fresh fruit and vegetables to Australians, or food for, purchased to Australians, fresh fruit and vegetable ones, um, compared to fifty percent for the major supermarkets. So, they're a real and viable section of the. Um, the food retailing landscape these days. Thank you. We'll come to you, sir. Your, your name and uh, where you're, uh, where Mark you're from. Mark Narrastrang, CBH Group again. Um, my uh, question is around uh, the theme of consumer empowerment um, and uh, a comment that you made, Trish, about um, uh, that government doesn't need to be involved in regulation. Um, and I guess what I was thinking about was the, the fact that tobacco consumers would be quite disempowered at this point in time, and that is because of government action. Um, and my putting two and two, two together, it's because tobacco is a known um, cause of, of uh, ailments and, um, and um, um, duress on the, uh, the public health system. So is it the case that obesity and diabetes and so on, there isn't a clear connection yet, or is it, what, what's the difference between the two situations we have? So I suppose Thank you. So I suppose for me, I, I don't think I said that the government doesn't need to be involved in food regulation. It certainly does in terms of safety and uh, quality of food and uh, claims around food. So there's definitely legitimate roles for government in food regulation. I just didn't think it was one around saying you must not eat this or you, you may not have, have this particular food. And I suppose for me, the difference between tobacco and my favourite food of evilness chocolate or, you know, bad, what I shouldn't eat as much of, um, is that, you know, there is no proven safe level of chocolate. But you think about other foods and, you know, in moderation, they're not bad. And we were talking before as a panel before we started this and I was, you know, there was this debate around, you know, maybe we should just ban McDonald's and ban the bad foods. And, and for me, I think about, you know, my mum, you know, bless her heart, 81 years old. We go up to Sydney a couple of times a year and she really enjoys stopping at McDonald's and having one of the little bags of French fries. And she does that twice a year. And, uh, you know, that's not... A, I don't think that's bad, you know. That's not... That's her treat. And, it's, and I think it's where we were coming from before is that the level of treats that potentially people are eating, I think... The number was 41% of your calories is coming from treats, and, and that tends to be the problem. So is it about the government saying, you know, there shouldn't be this food, we should stop it existing um, because people, some people eat too much of it? I'm not sure that that's actually the answer. I think the answer is that, you know, w human beings need to have some um, free choice when we can. We don't actually have no tobacco at all. We just have rules around it that 
make it a little bit more difficult for people to use it. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure that I'd support banning those things, but I think that uh, um, education, information, uh, providing people the ability to make an informed choice is, is an important factor. Should we come to another question here, Lisa, or would you like to comment on that? I would like to comment on that because I just want to answer the question about is there a relationship between obesity and in intake and things, and yes, there is, certainly for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, um, cancer, um, some mental health issues do have a strong relationship to obesity and overweight. Um, and also that goes to those things that are genetically not modifiable things, that are part of your genetics makeup, versus those things that are behavioural risk factors. And I think if we, again, look at those behavioural risk factors and look at some moderation and also look at the cause, cause and effect and what the implications are of some of our behaviours, we can do well. Lisa, could I put you on the spot? Would you, would you be advocating <coughs> greater regulatory powers from any form of tier of government in terms of the relationship between health and, and food intake? We're regulating alcohol in terms of what age. We regulate, say, tobacco. You're suggesting there's other forms of regulation that may or should be introduced for the future to reduce obesity, reduce the impact on on the health of a nation? Look, I think there are a range of measures really that can be used and, and I don't think the big stick is always the most effective, um, especially as the, as the first option. I mean, I think again, it's, it's working with health professionals, it's working with um, councils and planners and local governments. I mean, I've just seen a fantastic presentation um, from um, someone from New York City who was looking at the um, healthy city planning guidelines for New York and that is a, that's a group of retailers, um, uh, planning authorities, health departments, education departments that have gotten together and said, what can we all do that's, that's a, a lever and that's using carrots rather than sticks? Um, and it's, it's making things more available to people, fresh water instead of having to buy soft drinks, um, making sure that there are healthy food options around. So I don't think regulation is the answer. But if I look back at tobacco, when I was first started working and I had people smoking in the office next to me, that seems like a long time ago. And so maybe we've got a little bit to learn from smoking. The lovely days of getting on an aeroplane and being told, <laughs> smoking or non-smoking? And you're about a metre apart. OK, sir, number five, you might mention your name and organisation. Thank you. Uh, Bill Whitford, Royal Finance Corporation of Victoria. Just a contrarian view, perhaps. I've, I've heard from the panel that, that we're going to be inundated with information that the consumer gets to make the choice. Um, my, my view on life is that the consumer is basically lazy and, and they've got to rely on a couple of, of, of reliable friends to tell us how we should think, and that's going to be the advertising industry in the supermarkets. I'm just wondering if a comment on the board and shoot that, that, that view down in flames, perhaps. Thank you. Who'd like you to direct that question to? Well, it comes back to your personal utility, doesn't it? I mean, some, some consumers don't like a lot of choice. That's true. Others, others, like, uh, others don't think they've got enough choice. I think, I think what, what we're talking about here is, is catering to that whole range, really. Um, uh, and, uh, and for those who don't like making choices, you know, th that explains the growth of the... the may explain the growth of the uh, popularity of pre-prepared meals where someone else has made a decision about you know, uh, the serving size and the, and the portions and so on. And, uh, but again, companies are responding to that by delivering uh, those options. For, for others, it's, um, you know, uh, some, you, you, you see this yourself in the supermarket. Some people you see reading all the labels, you know. Um, others, you know, spend what, what the average time in the breakfast aisle, I think, uh, is 0 0.3 of one second for people to make their choice because they know what they want before they go in there. They walk along, they grab it, and they put it in, they go. So there's a whole raft, a whole range of consumer activity there. And uh, what's, what's changing now as we look forward to 2030 is, th is the technology is enabling a much broader range of consumer behaviour to be, to be uh, catered for. Uh, Bill, uh, about 50% of uh, consumer a choice of where they shop is just purely convenience. What's the closest place? What's the easiest place to park the car? Where do I get off the train? Um, that's a big driver. 
Uh, but technology is fundamentally altering that. Um, we're not only seeing uh, um, men on mobiles talking to wives, telling them uh, what the shopping list is, uh, but we're also seeing uh, increased home delivery of products as well. So I think technology is fundamentally altering how people shop. Can I come to the, uh, the, the Twitter followers, if I may? And are any, any Twitterers in the crowd that are providing some thoughts or ideas for the panel? <coughs> Anna Carr? Thanks, Mike. Yes, we've got a, a, a lovely bunch of tweeps out there who are sending in these messages. Are these One, the tweets from in the room? Tweeps. The tweeps. <laughs> tweets in the room and tweeps outside the room as well. So I, first of all, I come to Nathan Westling, who's asking, what percentage of products on the shelf are store-owned and how can consumers tell? For example, wine labels. Do you want to go one at a time, or there's lots of different Let's ones? Just, just have, uh, give us a range of them. We might, uh, we might pick one to try and follow through. Okay. Um, one that came um, next door from Rebecca Gowan, 36% of, of adults and 41% of kids energy comes from treat foods, which was retweeted from your, um, Lisa. How or why do you see that changing? And then um, one of the early ones from Chris at Quantum Glanes, is there a risk with any high popularity bubble, for example, the My Kitchen rules and those, as, as the fad passes and food goes um, back to, commu to commodities? So what was the first one again? First one was from Nathan Westling. What percentage of products on the shelf are store-owned and how can consumers tell, for example, wine labels? Okay, so the, the question's fairly and squarely to you, Rob. To yeah, no, I'm happy to answer that one. Look, about 25% uh, of the, the products on Coles shelves are private label or exclusive brands, uh, only sold at Coles. Uh, and that's in the broadest possible definition, so it includes fruit and vegetables, uh, meat and bread uh, that aren't branded. So we, we consider that our brand because it's not branded in the store, therefore we have to take brand ownership of it. Uh, if it's just plain grocery, uh, the Coles brand in a pack or the milk uh, or uh, wine uh, in a store, it's much a much lower percentage, uh, probably less than 10%. So the popular myth about private label or exclusive labels dominating supermarket shelves is quite frankly rubbish. Uh, three out of every four products on supermarket shelves are branded products. Uh, What's it? Products Sorry. made by Gary's members. And let's face it, supermarkets don't make the private label brands either. They're often made by Gary's same members. Having worked for a company that made private label bread and branded bread, I can assure you that uh, private label volume was essential to ensuring manufacturing efficiency. And without it, Goodman Fielder couldn't have made and sold the branded products, which made up a much smaller proportion of its product base. So there's a lot of misunderstanding about the level, the role, and the nature of private label. Indeed, I was uh, reading a number of case studies or success stories uh, on the plane up to Canberra today. Probably not everyone can see that, Rob, no, because you say what you're holding up. There are a whole up. raft of uh, two-page case studies. I've probably got about 17, 20 of them here that I was reading on the plane that we'll be releasing soon of small Australian farming families and small Australian family winemakers that wouldn't survive without private label or providing exclusive branded products in our liquor stores. They've made a success out of selling private label and people are going to be very misguided in some of the discussions about putting controls on private label because it won't be retailers that suffer, it'll be these guys the small food manufacturers who actually make a buck out of it. So I think I'm, I'm all for having a big national debate about private label, because I'm 100% confident when people know the facts, they'll actually come around to understanding it much better. Thanks, Rob. If I could if I just jump in there. That, I mean, there's no doubt it's part of the, um, the range of choices for consumers, but just very, very briefly, um, there, there, there is, uh, some concern across the manufacturing sector about 
what the impacts might be on uh, on innovation, and, and there's a there's a watchfulness around that, and it comes back to the point I made earlier about that we need to be vigilant about anything that impedes innovation, and um, and particularly in this area, you know, whether it's um, copycat packaging or, or free riding on innovation, we've got some concerns about that. But but you know, absolutely accept that it's part of the product range. Yep. Okay, we've got about uh, ten minutes to go now. I wonder if we can just move on to this idea of capacity. <coughs> we started to flesh out a bit of a future for our, our food preferences for the year ahead, years ahead. Do you see any major barriers to this future? Are there elements within society, elements within our, our culture, elements within our behaviour, elements within our institutions or even our policies that are hampering what would be seen by you as a, an efficient, productive, healthy, food future for Australians. Are there any major issues confronting us that you'd like in a big sense? We've only got 10 minutes, <laughs> so that's why I put it at 10 minutes to go, so we didn't focus this on uh, focus totally, but are there some major barriers to a productive, efficient and healthy future for our food choices? Who'd can like I to lead off? have a go? Have a go, Rob. Absolutely. Paint the picture for us. Um, Look, uh, we could be here for hours talking about the challenges facing uh, food production in Australia. As I said at the outset, I'm, I'm quite optimistic uh, about the future of food and I think we can overcome these challenges. Um, but having said that, in the next 10 years, the ageing of the Australian uh, farmer population uh, is going to uh, present significant challenges uh, to uh, how food is produced on the land in Australia. Uh, Bill and I are both board directors on the rural finance in Victoria uh, and part of our charter is to promote uh, young farmers to get onto the land. That's a very difficult job. It's really hard. Um, but we're not giving up and we're working at it quite, uh, quite diligently. Uh, the second one, and Gary referred to this and might want to elaborate on it, is cost competitiveness of uh, food production and manufacturing in Australia. Uh, we are so uncompetitive in Australia compared to our nearest neighbour, New Zealand. Uh, labour rates uh, in Australia, either in food manufacturing or, or retailing, are 25% higher than in New Zealand. And when you combine that with a currency that's 20% cheaper, uh, we're really up against it. Um, the third one is regulation. And while I'd be the first to say that there is a role for government in setting minimum standards, any country that has 1,500 local councils, seven state and territory governments and a federal government with a multiplicity of agencies is over-governed. It's ridiculous the extent of regulation in this country. It's just ridiculous. Just a small issue there, Rob. <laughs> just three small to get issue. going, huh? Can I come to you, Trish, if I may? Because I'll, I'll finish with you, Lisa, on this, this uh, question, if I may. I was very diligently taking down notes for the food plan, actually. Um, <laughs> but, and, and certainly those are the things that we definitely, you know, have heard quite a lot about um, as we go around the country talking about the food plan and, and, you know, getting feedback from people on what we've done so far. And certainly, you know, the ageing of the population, uh, the costs of labour, regulations are things that come up quite a lot. Um, the other thing that I think that comes up quite a lot with people is that um, the feeling that people don't value food production, that people in Australia don't value food and they don't value food production. Um, you know, that food is relatively cheap for most people in this country and that, um, you know, that leads to waste. But it also that they don't see producing food as, a, as an important job in society and something that can give a rewarding career and, um, and a rewarding life. And I'm, sp I'm sure that the people who are sitting in this room today would disagree with that. Um, but I think that's one of, the, one of the other issues that really comes through strongly. And, you know, and it's also not just the ageing of farmers, the ageing of rural professionals generally. You know, the fact that uh, I didn't meet a soil scientist under 50 years old in my travels around, and and those type of things that are um, that it, you know that 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 aging of the rural and uh, food producing population 
that's occurring. Um, not myself personally, obviously, I'm much younger than that. But Thanks, Trish. I'll come to you, Gary, if I may. Uh, yeah, just, just quickly, um, the competitiveness challenge, I think I put up there, uh, as Rob said, you know, um, uh, it, we are a high cost economy, input costs are rising, and, and at the uh, food manufacturing um, level, you, we've also had two years of retail price deflation. So, so you, you can see the squeeze there on, on, uh, on margin right across the sector, no capacity or very limited capacity to pass through uh, costs, although that's, um, there's some signs that that's starting to, to um, soften a bit. Um, uh, harken, uh, just to harken back to an early conversation about regulation, I think we need to be very careful about the perverse outcomes and unintended consequences of, of over-regulation. I mean, the fundamental uh, difference about what we're talking about here is none of the products that are commonly consumed in Australia, food products, are harmful of themselves. Um, uh, that's because we have a well-regulated food safety <laughs> uh, system. Um, and, uh, and morphing uh, a food safety regulation system that works well into a lifestyle regulation system is, is fraught with, with danger, not, not leaving aside that it, you know, it, it uh, undermines that notion of mutual responsibility, which is achieving uh, good things um, cooperatively. Uh, we, we need investment in innovation. Anything that, that um, hinders that is a problem. And, and given the scale of the big uh, global food companies, we, we need to be um, attracting more of the craft type proposals, inv investment in Australia, uh, driving value add here, driving uh, innovation here, and um, and be very careful about the signals we send that uh, dissuade that. And I'll just say one one other thing about the ageing of the population because it's been a popular topic. I I, um, I suspect that in 2030 we'll actually be less concerned about obesity and more concerned about undernutrition, and that's partly because of the ageing of the population. For, you know, around 40% of people aged over 65 are undernourished in Australia now. You've got, a, you've got an enormous bubble of those baby boomers moving through into that older demographic by uh, 2030. Um, you know, the number of people over 85 will have tripled. Um, and uh, you know, I, it will be interesting to watch that debate because it's, it, it, it's not on the radar at all at the moment, the problem of undernutrition among elderly Australians, or doesn't seem to be getting near the um, attention. Um, and uh, I suspect that um, by 2030, we, we, you know, the, the con community concerns may have shifted a bit. Thanks, Gary. To you, Matt. Um, I mean, uh, there's a few, quite a few things, some of which are out of my jurisdiction, but I'm going to have a go. Have a, a go, couple. anyhow. Um, but we're quirk of fate. I'm a primary producer myself, so I sort of some uh, normally around Christmas I, I, I we grow trees, and normally around Christmas I sort of read books about being a proper farmer. Um, and I, this year I read a book by Joel Salatin, who I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. But he uh, he talked about this issue of the and this, his book was from a while ago, admittedly. But he talked about this issue of of the the undervaluing of the farmer, and his his idea is that every farmer should earn the same and, uh, and be treated the same as any white collar worker. And I, and I think that, you know, that, that is an issue that is gonna be a, a real problem for us because you can already see that the consequence of that not happening at the moment is that it's, all, it's easier for farmers to sell their high value land near, near our cities to property developers um, than it is for them to keep on farming. And I think, you know, in terms of our own localised food system, there is a, it feels to me, and I don't have the stats, so I'm kind of going on what I read in the newspapers a little bit here, but um, it feels to me as though there is a threat to our, our own sort of localised food system as opposed to maybe the stuff that we can export. That's one thing that I think could get in the way of it. I think the other thing that can get in the way of it, and this might sound strange from somebody who works in and around the advertising industry, is I, I, I honestly do think that... Um, and again, a couple of people in the room, I'm sure, won't like this, is that you know, communicating to kids about food that isn't necessary, they don't understand what that food's doing to them during their TV programs, for me, feels like a, a, we're going, you know, things like, seems like a crazy thing to be doing. So I think a threat to our health, long-term health, our intergenerational health, 
um, could be improved if we if we had a good look at what that is all about and what that means to to um, to the people that we're communicating with. Thank you. As a last word, Lisa, you're fortunate enough to open, and I'm a, you're closing this session prior to me uh, saying thanks to you all, Lisa. Um, Thank you. I, I think that we've got to also look at barriers to our food future that um, include that it's not the same for everybody. We've talked about choice. We've talked about having too much choice and people who don't want to choose. But there are people who, because of market failures in geography, don't have choice. So um, in remote Australia, for example, where people have some of the worst health in Australia, you can't have access fresh fruit and vegetables and you, uh, your choices are often very high fat, high sugar, high salt choices. So I think that's an area that's going to be a barrier to our food future. Uh, and I think I just want to pick up on your point about um, undernutrition. Certainly some of the work we've done does show that um, older men and women in Australia aren't eating enough protein and women aren't eating enough dairy products and things. But I think the difference may be as I spoke before about um, our gains in cancer and our gains in cardiovascular disease, um, the wave of chronic disease that is coming and cancelling out some of the good gains we've made does cause a bit of a challenge for us in terms of how many of us will be reaching 85. Um, it was a very different person and they ate very differently, the people who are 85 now. Um, I think with the trends in, in overweight and obesity and behavioural risk factors, that will cause us to think slightly differently about our food future. Thank you, Lisa, very much indeed. So, ladies and gentlemen, we tried to focus on the consumer this afternoon to think through the value chain from the productivity end and focus our ideas and thoughts on the consumer and the future food preferences that our consumers might make. It has implications for us, implications for us all uh, in the way we approach our future. <clears throat> but if we could uh, thank our wonderful five-member panel, if we could thank Trish, to Matt, to Lisa, Gary and Rob, and also to thank Anna Carr for organising the session and her colleague Kylie Johnson. And my also my thanks to all the people who provided questions to the panel and those who tweeted to the panel as well. So I hope you enjoy the afternoon as we focus on the consumer and let's all join with me in thanking the panel very much indeed. We're two minutes overdue, it's 5.32, so uh, is there any other announcement I should make, uh, Anna? I'm sure there's fun outside and I'm sure there's uh, some things to think about prior to the 6.30 opening for your dinner tonight. Enjoy the dinner. <laughs>